Whiplash rules in the presidential race. Biden out, Harris in. Minnesota Governor Tim Walz on the short list for Harris vice president. And now Donald Trump and his running mate, J.D. Vance, are heading to Minnesota for a rally in St. Cloud. As the race hits reset, all old bets and calculations are off. Now, this is Talking Points on CBS News Minnesota. Good evening and welcome to Talking Points. I'm Esme Murphy. There hasn't been a presidential race this volatile since 1968, when President Lyndon Johnson shocked the nation and announced in March of that year he was dropping out of the presidential race. Joe Biden has dropped out in late July, weeks before the Democratic National Convention. Almost immediately, Kamala Harris has solidified her hold over delegates, becoming the only likely Democratic nominee. Among the names floated to be her vice presidential pick, Minnesota Governor Tim Walz. It all has to happen very fast. The Democratic National Convention is August 19th through the 22nd. Early voting in some states, including Minnesota, starts in late September. The attention for the moment may have shifted from former President Donald Trump, who just survived an assassination attempt and hosted the Republican National Convention. But in this shape-shifting race, the status quo is changing dramatically every turn. In Talking Points, we will look at the fallout from these unprecedented events with perspectives from political scientists and our Republican and Democratic analysts. Let's start with Professor David Schultz. Joining us right now is Professor David Schultz of Hamlin University. Thank you so much. Great to talk with you. Thanks, Esme, for having me. All right, let me ask you this. Um, a lot going on. Donald Trump, J.D. Vance are going to be here. Uh, on this weekend, also uh, Kamala Harris has raised $100 million in 36 hours for her campaign. What's going on? Well, what's going on is the rules of American politics are rapidly changing right now. And we've had a script going on for several months that it was going to be Trump versus Biden, and it was going to roll out as a replay. And clearly, all of that has been upended. And with that being upended, both the Trump campaign and now what's looking like the Harris campaign are resetting the dial. I mean, it's really a very different campaign now because the two of them, you know, Trump versus Biden, were locked in, I don't know, locked in a particular paradigm or a particular pattern of a contest. Harris has the opportunity to change the campaign. And with that, the Trump campaign knows it's got to change things too. What does it say to you that Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are coming to Minnesota to St. Cloud to hold a rally? It says a couple of different things. First, that they perceive that the state is actually in play in terms of the election. And if we go back and look at recent polling when it was still Biden versus Trump, it looked like Trump was within shooting distance of being able to win it. So one, could be the state is in play. But second, there's a tactically very smart move here, is that even if Minnesota is not in play, forcing Harris now to defend the state means that she can't spend time in North Carolina, Arizona, or other places. So the way I phrase it, every dollar spent by a Democratic presidential candidate in Minnesota, or every minute spent here, it was one less dollar, one less minute in another swing state. And same for the other side. Exactly, exactly at this point in terms of what's happening here. But also we should think about it is that even before uh, Biden left the race, they were trying to expand the game by contesting North Carolina. And even though I don't really think North Carolina is really in play, I think Trump's going to win it. The fact that the Biden campaign was campaigning, spending resources there means what? Every dollar that the Biden campaign spends in, I'm sorry, every dollar that the Trump campaign spends in North Carolina means one less dollar for Arizona, Georgia, other states. All right. Um, you know, for so long, we were hearing sort of people's thoughts and analysis of Kamala Harris from actually Democrats and Republicans, that she was sort of ineffective, not very popular, um, really is somebody who just was not doing much of a job of, of anything, although there, the vice presidency is kind of not much of a job of anything. It's, it's a difficult job to uh, describe. It seems like there's an awful lot of enthusiasm around her instantly in and that you can see that in that hundred million dollars in about 36 hours. What, what, what's going on there? 
Well, I think we have to also compare it to the lack of enthusiasm for Joe Biden, that he certainly wasn't encouraging, uh, really sort of getting anybody really excited about him. So part of it is relative. Uh, but also, I think it's important to think about it here because there's a, an expression that we heard this year for the first time called double haters, people who both hated Trump and hated Biden. Percentage estimates were about 20 to 25 percent. With Biden gone, we now have this potentially a quarter of the electorate um, that might have somebody that they're excited about. And so her, her substituting for Biden changes perceptions of her, changes perceptions of the evaluation of the race. And again, it's giving people a set of choices that up until what literally, you know, a few days ago, they didn't really have. And so that's, I think, part of the excitement here. You know, I, with, with everything changing so quickly and developments coming so quickly, I almost feel like Minnesota, especially with Trump coming here, and I'm sure that, that Harris will come here too, it almost feels like we're right in it and also just strap on because it's going to be quite a ride. You're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct in the sense that we are going to be part of it because we're part of the battleground of the Midwest. It's, it, I mean, really, the gateway to the presidency is the Midwest, including the upper Midwest, includes Minnesota. But also, if we just think about how this campaign has changed, is that for the Democrats to succeed, they need to have um, college educated women. They need to have people under the age of 30, people of color show up and vote. They were not excited by Biden. Now, there seems to be this sense, again, we don't know really yet, but there seems to be a sense that Harris is exciting those three groups, which is now going to force Trump to have to think about how to alter strategy, including a strategy that he was ramping up with the hope of trying to be able to win in Minnesota. So again, we are really part of the uh, the game for the, for the first time really in many years. All right, Professor Schultz, thank you so much. Uh, really a pleasure to talk with you. My pleasure. Thank you. Up next, Democratic analyst Abu Amara and Republican analyst Amy Koch. Well, joining us right now, Democratic analyst Abu Amara. Abu, thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for having me, Esme. All right, Kamala Harris, what are you hearing from Minnesota Democrats? What is their reaction to Kamala Harris's candidacy? I'm hearing two things. One, it's a shot to the arm of millions of Democrats across the country and in Minnesota. And the second is we're seeing enthusiasm that Democrats feared would not materialize. And so we're able to talk to new voters and reach new voters. And so across the board, it's been it's been a, a welcome thing. Uh, in terms of Kamala Harris, Democrats, a lot of Democrats, when they were asked a few months ago, even a year ago about Kamala Harris, there was not a lot of excitement around her amongst the Democratic base. Republicans, of course, have you know continued to, to rip her. But what has changed within the Democratic base that people are so excited about this candidate? She's raised over $100 million in 30 hours. Yeah, so I think for, for some, it's the prospect of having the first woman president. I think that's very exciting from a Democrat. Um, this, the second is there's a generational shift. And for many who felt like, you know, 70% of Americans thought both Donald Trump and Joe Biden were too old to be president. And so the Democrats are actually offering the American people a generational shift. And a lot of people are excited about that as well. And so the combination of those two things, I think, is reaching millions of voters in a way that's real. It's no longer just Kamala Harris as the vice president or number two. It is her serving as the potential president of the United States. What about uh, Tim Walls as her number two? Look, I think Tim Walls should be on any short list. If you think about what Democrats need to do to win, they've got to crisscross the Midwest, Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. You've got to have someone who's got the energy to do that, but also who knows how to go into cornfields and campaign on progressive issues and at the same time be able to campaign in the city. Tim Walls has illustrated he can do that in Minnesota. He's won in southern Minnesota, um, and he's also won in the Twin Cities. And so... If I'm Kamala Harris and thinking, how do I put together the coalition to win? Tim Walls would be on my short list. What does it say to you that uh, Donald Trump and J.D. Vance are coming to St. Cloud? Yeah, I think it says two things. So one is, I do think Donald Trump wants to expand the map. He knows that if he expands the map, he has more paths to get to 270 electoral votes. And then also, I think what he's doing is forcing the Democrats to maybe have to defend in states where they normally wouldn't have to, right? So if Donald Trump were to win Minnesota somehow, 
that would be an indication that he's probably won the election already. And so I think it's smart from the Trump campaign to spend earlier time now on those kind of tier two states, states that you're probably not going to win, but you're close to see if you can move the numbers. And so I, I expect him to maybe, you know, be here a couple of times over the next, you know, couple months. But at the end of the day, I think Minnesota is going to go blue. Democrat, Democrats privately have been, including here in Minnesota, have been pretty panicked privately uh, about the situation with Joe Biden and especially the impact on down ballot races going down to the state legislature. W are you hearing different things about that? And, and I mean, this unity bid on the Democratic side, is it going to fall apart as quickly as it has apparently on the Republican side? Well, I, I think the unity piece is actually critical. Like you said, the, the polling actually showed had Joe Biden been our nominee in November, the, the, the race essentially would have been a toss up. And then you start to look at things like the Minnesota State House and issues like Gaza and Israel and issues of Ukraine. I mean, there were a lot of things that Joe Biden was weak within the party on that Kamala now gets to redefine herself on. And so it's not just he wasn't strong, it's that parts of our coalition would never have turned out for him and Kamala can reach those voters. Again, young people I think are gonna be huge for Kamala. But, but you've got to admit though that the polls certainly were shifting against Joe Biden. There's, especially, there's in no after, question. especially in the aftermath of, of the assassination attempt on Mr. Trump and also the RNC convention, which was very well produced and, and had some pretty powerful moments. No question. The Republicans had a good week with the RNC. You add on top of that, Donald Trump, you know, thank God he did. He survived the assassination attempt. Those things really buoyed him, if you will. And Joe Biden had really hit his ceiling, if you will. The polling was indicating it wasn't just folks were saying, you know what, I'm not going to support him. There weren't areas for him to grow. And I think that's just so different with Kamala. Right now, her floor is high, but her ceiling is limitless. And I think there's millions of voters who are going to sit on the sidelines had Biden been the nominee, but I don't think that's the case anymore. All right, Abu Amara, thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Well, joining us right now, Republican analyst Amy Koch. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. A lot happening. Kamala Harris, what is the impact on the race? Wow. Well, first of all, for Republicans, you know, obviously they would ultimately have wanted to run against Joe Biden, particularly after the debate performance. Things were just, it was just a freight train for Donald Trump, right? It was just debate uh, to that assassination attempt uh, and the amazing imagery that came out of that, the unbelievable, you know, like for him um, and uh, and all the all the press and then rolling into an RNC that frankly was very, very well executed, just outstanding messaging. Um, and even and even his speech, you know, we talked about that. It was a little long, but um, but in the beginning, it was great. However, this definitely blunts some of that momentum. The attention has now refocused back to the Democrats and in a positive way, not just in a, when is he going to resign sort of way. So it takes that question off the table. There was definitely some fundraising around it. What, what I would say is, is it sustainable? Obviously there's a bump, obviously there's tremendous relief. You could literally hear the sigh of relief from my fr Democrat friends, <laughs> but is that sustainable knowing that Kamala by the way, dropped out very early in the Democrat uh, primary process, earlier than our own Amy Klobuchar. Um, and so, you know, there are reasons for that, right, as candidates. So, you know, being able to sustain this momentum that is now somewhat shifted, uh, that's going to be the question. And it's too early to tell. Well, let me ask you about the fundraising, because within the first 36 hours after Joe Biden drops out, she raised at this point, more than $100 million. That's a record. Uh, what, what, is, what does that say to you? Right, what I think that, well, a couple of things. I think that donors were holding back, no doubt. Plus, I think this is sort of like a vote. I, I think it's a vote from the Democrats to say, yes, hooray, relief, and also let's get behind one person. That's the other thing. Remember, there was talk of, would it be Vice President Harris or would it be someone else? This solidifies, it is Vice President Harris, and the only question now is who will be her VP? Well, that that is a, a big question, although obviously Tim Walls at this point that we're talking still in the running, but does a vice president really matter? No, well, not as much here now. Of course it mattered a lot more because we have, you know, the oldest candidates ever running. Right. Um, 
And so, so I think it matters somewhat less, but there's always a balancing of the ticket. There's always an evening out of the ticket. Um, and to that regard, there are some Republicans saying, well, was J.D. Vance now, knowing what we know now, which is too late, it's all hindsight, was J.D. Vance the best selection for Donald Trump? You know, that's water under the bridge. But, you know, people are asking, some people are asking the question. I, I think he, I was not super excited about the option, but I think it's a okay choice. I don't think it's so gonna from where you sit, because Republicans were sitting pretty, pretty <laughs> just, uh, you know, a short time ago. Do you think how much do you think the Democrats have helped themselves, if at all, with the Kamala Harris nod? Right. Well, it's impossible to say they haven't. I know I hear Republicans say, oh, this is even worse. I, I don't believe that because we all saw President Biden's performance and, and knew. However, I don't I think the initial excitement will wear off as the candidate sort of as she sort of reveals herself and how she does. And I don't know that it's sustainable. And also, like everything in this race, next in three days from now, we're going to be talking about all something new. So things just keep <laughs> Popping. <laughs> it, 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 it is incredible. I mean, these events are extraordinary. I mean, I think everybody's saying you have to go back to 1968 for a series of events this shattering um, yeah. and, and consequential. Um, do you think uh, that she is going to be able to help Democrats down the line? In other words, Republicans were saying just a short time ago, Trump is looking so great. This is going to be a huge boost to candidates, Republicans all down the line. Do you think that's in question now, or is it the same thing that you're saying that maybe that'll wear off? It it, it could wear off. Um, if it doesn't, then certainly she will, because it really wasn't a question between Biden and Trump. It was a question of Biden and just staying home. So for those that will now get out, which I think there will be more, that is going to help Democrats down ticket and potentially uh, put some hurt on Republicans down ticket. However, in the end, if Donald Trump is able to maintain the momentum he's on, that's still going to have tremendous help down ballot for Republicans. It really is this horse race now. It's just sort of evened up a little bit more, in my opinion, um, because because Biden was in such free fall. Right. And uh, the age question. <laughs> it's yeah. flipped. Um, how are Republicans going to deal with that? I mean, it is. Look, if it was a legitimate question for Joe Biden. And now Donald Trump is technically the oldest since Do Joe Biden last year or last four years ago. Um, you know, I think it's it, I think it's a legitimate question. He certainly isn't uh, he certainly wasn't isn't showing the age that Joe Biden was, but also Joe Biden wasn't showing his age four years ago either. So I, I think that's why the pick of J.D. Vance, 39 year old millennial. We talked about this. We miss Gen Z what, or Gen X. What a shame. Um, but but we moved on to a millennial. I think that's where people are looking at. Um, the vice president pick in a in a like a in a stronger light because of the the age for sure all right well listen amy coke thank you so much as always a pleasure yeah great to be on up next analysis from veteran political scientist professor larry jacobs joining us right now is professor larry jacobs of the humphrey school from the university of minnesota thank you so much for coming on good to be with you all right kamala harris now Another big change, another huge development. You know, this has been maybe the most remarkable uh, presidential election in the modern era. Uh, Kamala Harris steps in and it really uh, throws a monkey wrench into the strategy of Donald Trump. He was all ready to run against an old white guy uh, who was in failing health. And now he's got a younger um, black woman he's running against who brings a different record and different skill set. And I think it's gonna be a real challenge for the Trump campaign to shift gears. You know, Tamala Harris was depicted almost by people in both parties a few months ago as weak or not effective. And suddenly there seems to be an incredible response to her being the, the obvious or the future nominee. Uh, within 36 hours, a more than $100 million is raised. W what's going on? Well, I think there was a lot of support there for Kamala Harris. It was on the sidelines. So the money that came forward had been uh, really put on hold to put pressure on Joe Biden to withdraw. As soon as he withdraws, the money comes okay. uh, rushing in. So I think this was, in a lot of ways, expected. In terms of um, the appeal of Kamala Harris, I mean, are there specific groups that you think 
or that the Democrats are hoping she can energize? Well, one of the big questions about uh, Joe Biden was he was losing a lot of support among uh, Black Americans and Hispanics. And the expectation of Democrats is that Kamala Harris will reverse that uh, and that Black Americans will start uh, coming back to the Democratic Party and to her candidacy. That's going to be a challenge for for Donald Trump in states like Pennsylvania and Michigan uh, and elsewhere. In terms of actual campaigning, you know, being out every single day in a different state, in a different town, campaigning hard, doing interviews with local stations, that's kind of the traditional hard way of, of really running. Joe Biden did not do that in 2020. He was much more sort of reserved, held back. He, he, he had a more limited schedule. It looks like Harris might be on a more aggressive schedule and Trump is certainly on a more aggressive schedule. Does does actual campaigning, getting out there every day, does that make a difference? You know, I think for Kamala Harris, it's going to be important both to get her name out there, because a lot of Americans won't know who Kamala Harris is. Plus, she's got a lot of work to do to interest and engage Democrats who have shown a lot less enthusiasm for this election than Republicans. So yes, I think this is going to require an enormous amount of energy and campaigning by Kamala Harris if she's going to have a, a shot to win the election. Donald Trump's reaction, he seems to be mad. Well, you might you might have some sympathy for the guy. They've invested billions of dollars into running down Joe Biden. All of a sudden, that money is no longer uh, worth a whole lot, and they've got to gear up and face a different candidate with a different set of skills. And we can see that Kamala Harris is going to use her unique background as a prosecutor to go after uh, Donald Trump, who has been convicted of 34 felonies. That's going to become a big talking point uh, for Harris. It's going to force Donald Trump more on the defensive and try to find ways to counter that. This is going to be, you know, when it's really engaged, it's going to be a ferocious campaign, I think, and it will present challenges for Donald Trump, who has not responded well to uh, black women prosecutors in New York and Georgia. How about um, vice presidential candidate Tim Waltz? Is that a possibility? Absolutely. I think Tim Waltz is on the short list for the uh, Harris campaign. They're looking for candidates uh, for VP who can help to expand the, the reach of the Harris ticket. They need to be able to appeal to independence, to those swing voters who are yet to be persuaded. And uh, Tim Waltz has had a terrific record in reaching across the aisle uh, for voters who are independent, some uh, Republican. His military record, uh, again, something I think the Harris uh, campaign will be interested in. And just quickly, that 2023 legislative session where, of course, he was the one who signed the bills, a progressive dream list of legislation. Is that going to help? Can, I mean, that was really quite a year. It was quite a year, and I'm sure that's something that the Harris campaign is going to be concerned about because they are looking to moderate their image. They're looking, oh, really? they're looking for ways to broaden the base. They are behind in the battleground states of Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, and a host of others. So they're looking really, how can we appeal to those independent voters. It is also true that, uh, you know, building the enthusiasm of progressives is going to be important, but I think they're going to think primarily about how do we win the battleground states? All right. Larry Jacobs, thank you so much. Always a pleasure. Good to be with you. And that does it for this edition of Talking Points. As always, feel free to email me with comments or suggestions at esme at cbs.com. The show streams every Wednesday and Thursday at 6.30 and 9.30 p.m. on CBS News Minnesota. On Friday, the show posts to YouTube for on-demand viewing. Thanks so much for watching. I'm Esme Murphy, WCCO News.